Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Stray Pixels podcast, which is in no danger of being acquired by Tencent or becoming an Epic Game Store exclusive unless Jacob sells us all out for V-Bucks. Jacob. <laughs> uh, I'm Noisy Pixel staff writer Colin Buchanan, and I am joined, as usual, by my co-staff writer Nathan Mejia and our editor-in-chief, Bailey C. Mangle. How are you guys Hi. doing this week? I'm poggers, man. We saw that really great Hogwarts legacy state of play. I still haven't watched it, and I'm not going to. Hey, let's talk about J.K. Rowling. Straight, no, I'm straight pictures rather is not. trans rights, and that's all. That's all that needs to be said. So I'm, I'm in a moment. very weird spot for that. Oh boy, Day. here we we'll, go. Well, that we'll talk about off camera. But sure, that one. Yeah, that, that's gonna be some we... Patreon content. <laughs> yeah. Um, the real thing is that. Oh my God, I'm preparing for next week. What's so what's many game thing? releases, dude? Oh my god! We got well, Ghostwire Tokyo, oh, Ruin Factory oh. Five. Those are the two oh, biggest things ever. I'm still <laughs> going through Final Fantasy Origins. I got uh, that new game that Azario uh, handed off to me. It's almost done for the review. I'm not going to say what it is. Good boy. But, mm. but that is almost in the can. And I'm just going to go in like, oh god, I'm going to survive next week. <laughs> How am I going to work next week? <laughs> I have no embargo, bitches. By the time whatever this I want is out, I think our review should be up for Room Factory. Is, I think it, I think it just went up. Actually, didn't it? No, it embargoes Tuesday. Embargoes Tuesday. Yeah, I think so this will go up before the review will because I'm looking to yeah. start posting at seven a.m. Mm, um, just because yeah. I feel like most podcasts usually go out in the morning. Um, good luck with some with them having a Zario. <laughs> it's hey, hey, it's not up to Zario anymore. Oh, so that's after right. he, after oh, he messed shit. up last week, yeah, and um, forgot <laughs> he messed up so bad last week that he made me upload the podcast. Oh, they think I'm more power now, yeah. Man. Before you know <laughs> it, you'll see more content where it's just me and my my face going like, Well, oh, last shit. time when we well. talked about this. <laughs> about this viewer <laughs> we'll now go through the entire fred canon well that sounds like a good fucking podcast series actually because <laughs> i stole the idea <laughs> we'll call it the fred cast oh boy <laughs> so for the last couple of weeks we've been uh for lack of much else to to discuss in terms of like actual relevant topics to the news of the day. Uh, we've mm -hmm. been sort of dissecting uh, our experiences with the first six Final Fantasy games, and that series will continue. We just didn't want to, to front load it so much. Um, so we had to kind of come up with something else for this week's podcast, uh, mm -hmm. because I don't really think that any of us wants to talk about the state of play uh, once again, two weeks in a row. Um, so what we decided on this week was a topic that we've kind of had in the can for a minute, and that is uh, a, a, a double topic of uh, games that should not have had sequels and games whose sequels were surprisingly good, uh, usually meaning like ones that were an improvement over a mediocre first showing. Um, so I want to know, Bailey... What is your what is your first choice for a game that got a sequel that should not have had one? Uh, you know, Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> I don't believe you. A really terrible. Like, it series. sets up a, it sets up the sequel too at the end of the game. He hasn't found Riku yet. Well, which sequel am I talking about, Colin? Yeah. <laughs> am I talking about Chain of Memories or am I talking about Kingdom Hearts? <laughs> <laughs> he, I mean, technically, he finds Riku in Chain of Memories. He just doesn't know or, it. Or is he talking about three, five, eight over three, five, eight days over two? Place. Yeah, which sequel are we talking about, Colin? Could be any number of sequels. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Look, if we want to have a serious discussion, I've got, I've got the really obvious one in 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 the modern day in the tank. What? what? I have the Last the of Us. Uh, uh -huh. That's like the most obvious one. That is yeah. the most obvious it's, it's one. A, it's a good, you know it's what? A good I'll die not about it. It's Bro, a good one. I, I think I need 50% more neck beard to talk about The Last of Us <laughs> too. <laughs> it, I was so good. This one is just a case of ruining a perfect ending. Um, mm -hmm. Because... I, I think that they kind of captured lightning in a bottle with spoilers for The Last of Us Part Part 1 and Part 2, obviously. Um, but I think that y'all have probably played it by now. 
Um, so the last of us part one ends Joel incredibly dies. ambiguously. Joel does not yeah. Joel does not die in the in the first game. Um, not in the first game. Instead, instead the implication is more that uh Ellie and Joel are going to to uh at least have a strained, if not a a uh very imminently ended relationship by the end of the first game based on how you read the final lines of the game, whether or not Ellie knows what Joel did in order to, to rescue her and the fact that she wasn't given a choice in the matter. Um, and that kind of hangs really large over the end of the game and got a lot of debates going about like, well, does she actually know if she knows what she's going to do about it? <laughs> um, but I felt like those questions that were left unanswered were part of the appeal of this ending as opposed to like something more direct and straightforward. And then the last of us part two kind of takes that ending and stomps all over it. <laughs> My game of the year, man. So I've, I've only played the last of us parts. <laughs> <laughs> much to nathan's chagrin hey man i i still haven't played it but i still but i feel like with as much discourse i've heard that i've played the game three times through with how much i know it's, about it's it. a really interesting scenario because i've i've heard all about the first game so it feels like i practically played it right sure and so when two came out and i heard all the drama i was like man you know what i gotta play two <laughs> I got to see how bad 2 is. I played it so that I could have my own opinion about it, and I literally had a nervous and breakdown like, near the end of the game because I was like, this is still yeah. going. This is still going. And, like, a, a lot of the problem is that my take and what I read as the intended take of The Last of Us Part 1 is The Last of Us Part 1 is the story of a man who tries and fails to get over the death of his daughter. Mm -hmm. Um and I do not feel like that is carried into the sequel uh, really at all, especially since, like, the, the game so quickly frames Joel's death as, like, cruel and wrong when, like, when we see in every single flashback sequence that Joel spent years just gaslighting the shit out of Ellie <laughs> until she literally held him at gunpoint and demanded that he tell her the truth. <laughs> Not a gunpoint, but said, if you don't if you don't tell me the truth right now, I'm driving away and you'll never see me again. You know, I miss when Naughty Dog made Jack, man. I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I too miss miss when Naughty Dog, Dog was good. <laughs> I miss the old Naughty Dog. I miss Infamous. Yo, no, wait, Infamous was Sucker old, Punch, excuse me. Oh yeah, that was so oh fuck it. Yeah, like, that was kind of like melt a bit. A little bit. But you know what what Naughty Dog could never can never replicate? Oh. What was that game? Was it called Way of the Warrior, Way of the Ninja? Let me look it up. It's an, How do you set old... this up and not know what it's called? You should have been uh, doing it. Because I fucking forgot, man. I don't, you want me to go back and really remember all of Naughty Dog's games? No, I want you one. to, when you have a Nathan. thought for how you want to respond to a question, Google the, 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 the thing that you're... It's Way of the Warrior. It's Way of the Warrior. Okay, Nathan. All right. Never heard of this game. Yeah, no, nor shouldn't you. It's a Mortal Kombat clone. Ooh, exciting. <laughs> All right, Nate, yes. what do you have for a game that shouldn't have had a sequel? Yes, so we'll see so funny enough that we're talking about uh, Naughty Dog and Jack. Um, I hate, I, like, I don't hate Jack 2, but Jack 2 frustrated oh, me boy. so much. This might be I was though. like, <laughs> Jack 2 shouldn't have existed. Oh, no. <laughs> see, it's it's hard with with the Jack and Daxter series because so obviously the the tone of the game shifts so much from from you know a bouncy mascot platformer mm -hmm. uh for the first game to like almost Grand Theft Auto like cartoon Grand Theft Auto before Grand Theft Auto mm -hmm. itself was a cartoon uh in Jack 2 and 3 yeah and then they hired out a team to make a, a it's like to go back to just mascot platforming for the Lost Frontier. And the Lost Frontier mm. sucked. <laughs> yeah, the Lost Frontier. I forgot that game existed. Yes, as you I probably did. Could. Like, it is a game that released simultaneously for the PS2 and the PSP. Oh, that's a, that's a weird. That should, that should tell you things. That's a weird combo. It does tell you things. It tells you things when Daxter also, was a better game. I know. Also, I liked Daxter. Ratchet Size Matters, right? It was also PSP, PS2. Uh, Ratchet Size Matters was originally released on the PSP and then it was ported mm, to the PS2, but that was also farmed out to 
a different team that was not Insomniac that made that. Mm-hmm. But it's it's kind of an interesting case where like they they attempted to go back to the style of the original that people liked and it was bad, but it was yeah, also no, Jack is... that had made that game had moved on to bigger and better things by then. I yeah. I do understand why why people don't like Jack too, but it's like it I've never seen a series shift so drastically but still kind of feel like like how it was at first because it's like it's still like a mm-hmm. platformer yeah right but like, yeah it, pretty it, that it hard just, yeah it's just like it's like its tone is just completely different <laughs> it's so different it's so much more dramatic suddenly jack is a dark broody boy <laughs> i mean uh... I think his first scene is him screaming into Daxter's face. Yeah, yeah he's he's, so. he's 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 getting like fucking like tortured or something, and he's yeah. he's fucking like just trying to break. I was like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in some ways, that entire tone shift, like I, I think, would have benefited from not being tied to Jack and Daxter, because you know, I even I was like, what in the world am I playing? This is really Jack too. I'm um, considering that I actually played Daxter <laughs> before I beat Jack One or Jack Two. You know, I kind of like because I I love bringing up Kingdom Hearts. It kind of feels like how drastically the tone shifted from one to Chain of Memories. Mm-hmm. It kind of feels like that because because one does not feel like it's the same thing as any other future game. <laughs> it's like, it's oh. so it's so different. It's yeah, yeah. and like oh. Jack Two is like it's on like mm-hmm. a higher scale of like what the fuck is this, but. Yeah. I, don't, I think it still has like the same like DNA kind of. Kind of. I could say the same thing for Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 2. Oh, Mass Effect, here we go, boys. It's nice I was, I here was here. expecting you to bring this up in the second half. Yeah. Um, well, because it's weird because Mass Effect could actually belong in both camps, or both of these segments. Oh, boy. Here we go. Because technically Andromeda probably shouldn't have existed, even though I like Andromeda. And then you can kind of say the same thing about 3, but then 2 is like was back in the 2010s considered the best game ever. And when's the Mass Effect podcast? uh, I assure you when Mass Effect 4 slash 5 comes out. I assure you. (laughs) Yo, wait, like, is that actually... Have you played Mass Effect ever? I'm pretty sure that that Nate is the only one of us that has. I think (sighs) we might have to go on Azario's podcast. (laughs) Going to Azario podcast would be insane. What a (laughs) cold. Good question. That is a good question. <laughs> Got a fuse your name. Got to make a fucking ship name for you two. Come on, Nazario. Nazario. <laughs> Nades are no. That's too. No, I think Nazario is the, the only one that could work. Azarian, Azarian, or something like that. Would be the other one better than Seti or Creppy? Yo, we're talking about the, the what is the iCarly podcast? I refuse. I refuse. <laughs> oh, you're so stupid. I refuse. Bailey, do you have a, a an actual answer for a game that shouldn't have had a sequel? <laughs> um, let me see. So, like, here's where it kind of delves into like gray territory, like kinda. Mm-hmm. So. Devil May Cry too. Um, Ooh, because I have to elaborate. So I don't know if you've played Devil May Cry, Colin, or like any yeah. of the other. I so two was like, them, yeah. so two was like really, really bad. Mm-hmm. Gross, um, disgusting, terrible. But it's also it also felt kind of necessary, like probably to pave the way for three to be good. Mm-hmm. I have a lot so, to say about this. I'm excited. <laughs> Like I'm not like a massive like DMC guy. Like I play them all. I I I think they're like fine games. Two is like I I don't know how two got made because two does not feel like remotely the same game to play as like any other game. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's it's such like so like someone has to like really play it to understand how bad it is. Mm-hmm. But like it doesn't feel like there was any modicum of thought put into how the combat worked in that game. Mm-hmm. And I have no idea how they jumped from one to that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, because of how bad that is, I presume three was because three is really fucking good. So I presume they took like the heat from two and and were like, oh shit, we gotta like make something that's that's like not not two. All right. 
Oh, here, here's a little backstory for Devil May Cry 2. Oh, here we uh, go. So Devil May Cry 2 was actually greenlit, greenlit before Devil May Cry 1 was really even out. They Capcom looked at this, looked at the thing, went, okay, yeah, let's get this other team to work on it before this game had oh, even come out. No. So they didn't know who Dante was. <laughs> they didn't know the, the oh, game story. They just no. kind of knew this is kind of what we want. Uh <laughs> That's Which crazy. is why Devil May Cry 2 is so different. And one of the big key facts is that Dante shuts up in Devil May Cry 2. <laughs> so, like, I don't think that's really bad, per se. Like, like I like I don't... like So, like, I don't really give a shit about Dante, like, to be honest with you. But, like, I think... Because they try to give him, like, depression or something, right? Into, like, mm -hmm. from what I remember. Like, I think that's a cool, cool idea. It's just like I just don't know if a second game was the right time to do that. <laughs> a second game that is still at the end of canon, by the way. Oh, as far it is! As I it is! It is! Oh shit! I forgot to the end of the canon. Yeah. Oh shit! Wait, this is actually fucking genius. Wait, <laughs> some fucking he fucking goes through some real shit, man. Yeah. And he's fucking tired of it all. I just can't wait for the DMC Devil May Cry cross DMC. Oh my god, yo, I can't wait for that sequel. Like, yo, that's gonna be fucking incredible, actually. Yeah. With the better taunt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can go on, but uh I've got I've got one thing, that uh oh boy, here we go. I've got one that works more in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Um a game that we shouldn't have wanted a sequel to. Oh, no. That is Deadly Premonition. Oh, Deadly. <laughs> this is this is Nate's game. <laughs> oh, that that's a good one. That's a real good one. <laughs> so, <laughs> when Deadly Premonition Two was announced, I think that a lot of us were pretty concerned about certain aspects of the game, especially given the idea that there might be more money put into it, that it might have you know more oversight, because that is one of the reasons why. Uh, Deadly Premonition 1 is so strange is because like it had oversight but it would it would be more accurate to say that it had executive meddling and really nothing past that um, because the reason why the game's combat feels so shoved in is because it is. This game was initially uh, conceived as just being a straight up detective story and the publisher was demanding that there be some kind of action combat element in it. So we got weird other worlds with zombies in them that are complete plot cul-de-sacs and are not really referenced outside of the action levels themselves. Like we don't we don't have any idea what was going on with that. It's, it's actually kind of contrasted by uh, Alan Wake, which is sort of a, a dueling property for it that does say, no, yeah, all of this stuff that's happening to him is real. It is all actually happening. And at the end of the game, like there's a little narrative beat that mentions, hey, a bunch of people went missing during the time frame that the game takes place from this small town because they turned into the Taken and were, were you know, dispatched. With Deadly Premonition, it's so weird that I don't know why we thought that we could capture <laughs> capture lightning in a bottle twice. But you know who apparently thought that he could was Swery. Uh, Swery took all of the <laughs> all of the discussion of Deadly Premonition one being so bad it's good and decided, oh, so to make a sequel, I just have to make a bad game. And that's what we got was a bad, that, poorly running game. That was the lesson that was learned because the first game is honestly kind of magical. Like I, I personally held the belief that Deadly Premonition shoots past so bad it's good into just being unironically good. It is compelling. The twists are all really good. And I think that it is better than a lot of the people who I who enjoy ironically give it credit for. But that is not the take that most people on the internet have. The take that most people have is that the game is good because it is so terrible. And clearly that is what the second game leans into because he decided that he did not have to make a game that run that ran anywhere near consistently. So mm -hmm. the frame rate is so bad that it can induce, mo induce motion sickness. Wait, so like, <laughs> you can't tell me the, the bad frame rate is intentional. Right. I honestly don't know because, like, I've gone back there, and there's, forth on this there's, one. There's no way in hell that they would do that intentionally. So, because like the game <laughs> does not, weird. 
the game does not look that good. Like, it's a Switch exclusive, but even being a Switch exclusive, it looks eh. But, yeah. like, the game has been patched uh, Ooh, since, patch, since launch. Patch, patch, patch. So, uh, when Deadly Premonition 2 came out, it was pretty heavily criticized for taking the one really problematic element that the first game had and not fixing it, which is Swery's uh, writing and depiction of queer people. Um, so spoilers for the first game, one of the primary villains is a gay man who harbors a crush on a straight man that drives him literally insane. And Wait, also what? it turns out he's a cross-dresser. Yeah, what the fuck is this game? <laughs> and he's also screwing every woman in the town. What? What is this game? It's nuts. Yeah, and it's, it's not <laughs> great. It is It is easily just a really bad moment in a game that I oh otherwise really God. like. And obviously, I'm a member of the community that is being, you know, represented here. So oh. I am I am somewhat allowed to be like, no, as a person who who is, you know, also gay myself, I can look past this. I can understand that it's a product of its time and of its culture, and I can appreciate the game anyway. Deadly Premonition 2 is transphobic. Like, just um... straight up it is. Um, and... It, when Swery said, okay, I, I want to, to respond to some of the criticism of the game. I want to patch it. I want to fix some of this to make this right for my fan base. And what he did was make it maybe 10% less transphobic. And then he said he was happy with it. What the does that mean? As it exists now is really offensive, um, awfully just, just garbage in terms of the actual play experience because it runs like shit. Um, and is extremely repetitive, and he says he's happy with it. So, how is the good life? Is my is my my next question? We reviewed it. Apparently, it wasn't great. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's wow. it's kind of boring. Uh, honestly, uh... It, it it gets kind of towards the weirder that I know for uh, sweary, but I much prefer Deadly Premonition and JJ Macfield, which is the funniest thing in the world because JJ Macfield does queer representation the best out of all these games. What's frustrating is that the one thing that did need a sequel that Swery has made uh, is basically guaranteed to never actually even see a, a mm -hmm. final chapter, and that Wait, is what? D4 Dark Dreams Don't Die. Yeah. Oh, shit. There, there's a lot of lore I'm like, learning today about So that. D4 <laughs> uh, features some reimaginings of characters from, from the other games, um, mm -hmm. but is meant to be much more just straight up like a weird comedy detective story that that leans very much on like, you know, B-movie satire and stuff like that. And I played it. It was fun. But the thing was that when this game came out, it was an Xbox Connect exclusive. Mm -hmm. And what it released with, it was an episodic game that originally chapter released one. the prologue, chapter one, and chapter two. Yeah. The rest of the game was never released. Oh no. Yeah. And, yeah, it was Xbox exclusive, and, and it wasn't bad for a Kinect game. Again, oh, really? I played it for a 360 yeah. or for an Xbox One Kinect game. It controlled pretty solidly. I, oh, I, yeah. I I did enjoy my time with it, but yeah, it it basically flopped really hard, and Microsoft said, "No, nah, we're not gonna." We're can't not gonna blame them. The rest can, of the game can blame them. I can because retroactively. Uh, Deadly Permission 2 is also supposed to be a sequel to, to D4. And it's, it's supposed to, or at least the plans for D4 got rolled into Deadly Permission 2. So when's the Sweary podcast is my next question. Oh boy. You haven't well, even played Deadly Premonition. <laughs> we don't like we, it we also that. have to talk about Twin Peaks at that point if we're going to do anything I'll about be, Swery. Yep. I'll, I'll be the audience self, self insert and just not know what the hell's happening. You'll just do it. <laughs> Like like you were in the Digimon podcast. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm the I'm the fucking self self insert. <laughs> yeah, and uh, these Swery games is where I got my taste for like weird like games and why I even played Conception. Yo, I was Conception. Like, yo, I was wait, like, Conce wait, Conception, yeah. the best sequel ever made. Dear Lord. Oh yo, wait, Conce oh wait, when's the <laughs> yo fucking has no never Conception. never. 
<laughs> Never. Yeah. Colin, have you, have you played a game where you get to have sex with anime girls? But no, not how I watched the anime, which was even worse. There's an anime? I didn't yes, know there's an anime. anime. So it's there's actual. an anime. It aired a couple years ago. It oh, is no. pretty widely seen as one of the worst shows uh, of the decade. Why, why it is it cuts bad? out all of the dungeon crawling bits. Uh, like, that kind of, so that it is kind of just a creepy dating simulator with a mascot character who never shuts up and never stops making masturbation jokes the entire show. So like it kind of makes sense because the dungeon crawling nothing really happens <laughs> yes but it's the part of the game that like people actually kind of enjoy you know i was there for the dating sim shit but i, didn't I don't give think you were the dungeon crawling. i was there for the dating oh. sim man did you play <laughs> okay then i guess go play record of agoras war or something Yo, I guess we're Bro, so when are we gonna have the record of agoras war Agarest podcast two. never agoras 2 is so good all right wait we're digging into, into fucking schools that i forgot about Oh my god. <laughs> Yo, Conception I, 2, Agoras 2. Oh my god. I have I have another actual answer if we Antonia. want if we want to discuss one more. Yeah, no, I, I wanna wanna hear. My last one is Dead Space. Oh, that's another one. Oh, and that's a here's good one. the thing. This one is complicated because Dead Space 2 is better than Dead uh -oh. Space 1. Uh oh, so I don't. Do I, I don't like think that that's a controversial. Games? I don't think that that's a controversial opinion. Or what are you um, But the thing about that is that Dead Space One, when it was originally being made, and this is pretty common knowledge at this point, uh, was originally intended to be like this weird cross media massive franchise, and I don't know why EA had that expectation. Uh, because this is not at a time when horror properties were really blowing up the way that Resident Evil did. Like, they thought there were going to be live-action movies made. They thought that they were going to have a comic that was ongoing, Yo, maybe a TV yeah. show. And it's like, I don't know a book why they thought any of this was going to work out. Like, there were a couple books. But yeah. the game is fairly self-contained. Um... It's extremely good. Dead Space One, yeah. like that's that's I like I think that's something that we're all worried is going to be lost in in the upcoming remake that nobody wants mm -hmm. is is like the actual like horror magic that the first game captured. Where at the time it came out, it was the best alien game that had ever been made. Yeah. <laughs> it um, was, but with the expansion and scope that was seen in the sequel. Uh, which again is a is a better game. I think that uh, that kind of opened the door to what we saw uh, just completely destroy the franchise in Dead Space Three, um, because the expanding scope of uh, <laughs> of the set pieces, despite the diminishing returns that the game was basically guaranteed to have, was what killed the franchise <laughs> at the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a lot of fatigue, and especially with three, um, three was going to be really interesting because if they're going to do co-op, they wanted to do co-op. Like the other character was supposed to be Dark Isaac, Shin Isaac, as you will, mm -hmm. um, who would be in Isaac's head. So near the end, that's what it would be. Was that it would be revealed that this was all in Isaac's head, mm -hmm. and there'd be more psychological e efforts where player two would be seeing psychological effects that player one can't see and vice versa. So there's a lot of expectations on this game that EA said, no, no, the books didn't do well. The animated series, the animated movie didn't do well. Um, Dead Space Extraction did okay. Uh, Which is a shame. It was really good. It was really good. It was, it was a really good light gun game for the Wii. Um, EA really cucked them, though. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this was about the time during the seventh generation when co-op multiplayer was the thing that apparently every fucking game had to have. Yep. All of them. This is why this is why um Bioshock 2 had multiplayer. And Bioshock 2's multiplayer is not bad, but it's fine. You can kind of understand like why was this in why was this in this game? <laughs> That, yeah. that is so well known specifically for being a single player, extremely narrative driven adventure. Mm -hmm. um, so EA cut the Dark Isaac stuff and replaced Dark Isaac with some random schmuck named Carver. Carver. And then forced 
co-op upon basically the entire game to the point where there are areas that you cannot play Wait, what? in the campaign as a single player. You oh, have no. to and you have to have a co-op partner. Oh no, it's so bad. Um, and all of this is on top of you know the beginnings of microtransaction culture. Dead Space 3 was not that bad on microtransactions. The presence of them was obviously a red flag, yeah. but it was not nearly so egregious as what we'd see from from like later Ubisoft games, for example. But honestly, it was the co-op of it all because mm -hmm. horror games work best when you are isolated. Um, and I think that this is one of the reasons why games like Left 4 Dead 2 are not really seen as being horror games. They have yeah. horror elements, but they are mostly co-op action games. Yes. Um, and I think that just forcing the second character uh, to be even necessary for certain areas kind of yeah, kills that's, that's the good. ability to be afraid <laughs> because yeah, you not... have backup. You're yeah. not all, you're not alone. Well, and then in the dark, because that with the cust the weapon customization, which is where the micro transaction transactions came in, and you could make a weapon that literally just blew through enemies like nothing. Yeah, and I mean to be fair, Dead Space was already somewhat famous for having a weapon that you could singularly use to get through the entire game, because there's even a, an achievement for just using the plasma cutter to get through the first two games. Oh, but in this the third game, game, you can really easily just make every single fight a complete joke with the yeah. weapon customization system, mm -hmm. and it just it just kills it. Yeah. By the end of it, I don't care about Isaac. I don't care about Ellie. I definitely don't care about Carver. Well, I know we we got the remake coming up, man. They're gonna enhance the, the, the they're Bro. gonna enhance the story. <laughs> the only way they can enha enhance the story is if they pull the fucking Altman stuff from the book. Because I they're gonna maintain... have to rewrite the twist. Is the yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, um, that's right. I forgot about the twist. Because the twist is one of like the biggest moments of the original game, and it's going to be completely lost if they just keep it 100% intact. They're going to have to figure out a way to redo it. That would change the... Oh, that's going to be so weird, because that would change the marker almost completely with what it does. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've, you know, like, um, like um, even if someone's like never played it yet? If, Do we want to say what the twist is? I don't, I don't care. I'm, I'm not going to play this. You're not going to play it? So, in, in Dead Space 1, your whole reason of going on this mission into this mm -hmm. planet cracker is for your girlfriend, Nicole. Uh, the coolest thing they do is that they spell out this... They, if you take the first they letter spell... of every chapter name, they spell it out. Mm. Nicole is dead. Oh, no, Nicole. The character that has been speaking to you the entire game doesn't exist. It is it is the alien marker that has generated all of the 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 necromorphs, uh, basically oh. pressuring uh, Isaac through the game to to get closer to it so that it can mm. uh, basically enact its further plan and get closer to civilization. Um, oh, that's, that's really fucking cool, actually. So oh, no. it's very awesome. Um, not only that is that it actually also implants a way to make new markers inside someone's head because that's the way it works and it procreates. Was that it drives people crazy and makes them make new markers to then send off to other civilizations. Oh, it's the fucking heartless, man. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it goes deep. There's some deep cuts. And in the second game, the best thing they did is that Nicole is coming back, comes back as an adversary. Ooh, cool. Hot evil girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of concerned about what they intend to do with like the biggest narrative Wait, beat of I can the tell first you, game. I can tell you right now, Colin, right? They're gonna rename the chapters, right? And it's gonna and they're gonna spell out they're gonna spell out Nicole is alive. And the twist is she is the alien. I don't know, like <laughs> My my <laughs> concern is that like so what they could do is just write a different motivation for Isaac like that wouldn't be that hard Nicole no. is ultimately a plot device um, Feels but I don't I don't really know what they could do keeping that that character intact to yeah. to, to make the twist new again because just having her be alive and be the evil necromorphs or whatever like. Mm -hmm. 
it it basically accomplishes the same thing. Yeah. So, I don't know, but no. <laughs> I, I mean, they could do it where, she, like Billy said, she's alive, but she had escaped after her message, so mm -hmm. she was never on the ship to begin with. Maybe that could be something. Wait, but, oh no, like a, a better idea. But like that's also kind of weak. Yeah. Another idea. So. You know, bravely default, right? How they change the oh. fucking skills. <laughs> they're gonna like, they're gonna like change. No, so the the fucking chapter like um names are are gonna spell out. Nicole is dead? Question mark. <laughs> is she? Nicole dead? is the fairy. Yeah. Nicole. Nicole. Nicole lies. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! All right, go and dig us out. On that, on that strange <laughs> Did note, they crack uh, we're gonna take a quick break, um, and we'll see you guys right after to talk about games whose sequels surprised everybody. <laughs> so we'll see you guys in a minute. Yep. Welcome Freaking back from the break, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> In the first half of this episode, uh, we talked about games that probably shouldn't have had sequels. And in the second half of this episode, uh, we're going to talk about games whose sequels were better or potentially even redemptive for the franchise. Uh, and I'm going to start with one of the biggest examples uh, in modern history, and that is Titanfall 2. Ooh. That's a redemption arc. Yeah. So Titanfall uh, was created by Respawn Entertainment. Uh, it was basically the first thing that they did after they split off from Infinity Ward. Um, and it was a really hyped up Xbox One exclusive uh, that was an all multiplayer shooter where the gimmick was that uh, you could get in giant mechs and and <laughs> and combat them against people that were that were still uh, fighting on the ground level. Uh, I have a friend that that played Titanfall One. It's fine. I've played a little bit of it myself. It's fine. Um, it's it's a multiplayer shooter that came out at a particularly bad time, and it got kind of buried, and no one really cared about it. Uh, and then Titanfall Two came out. Now I will preface this by saying Titanfall Two was not redemptive sales wise. Um, it has become pretty infamous in recent times for being a game that is very cheap to acquire uh, to the point where people have found copies of it at their local Dollar Tree um, <laughs> in, the, in the past. But Titanfall 2 has a full single-player campaign with a shit ton of cool sci-fi gimmicks and a robot friend that you want to protect. And it's mm. so good. <laughs> It is unreasonably good. Titanfall 2 can't, Titanfall 2's campaign is like a 9 out of 10. Easy. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Like, it's straightforward, but it's emotionally effective, and it sort of, it feels almost like, um, like Bumblebee, like the, the Transformers spinoff movie that gets you to, like, actually, like, empathize with and care about and want to protect this big giant robot who's learning how to express his feelings. Mm -hmm. Like... No, it's so good. And it cried at the end. <laughs> we all cried at the end. <laughs> and then it's it's become like kind of famous for being mm -hmm. a game that people try to convince their friends to play because no. like it's Titanfall 2. What would make you want to play Titanfall 2? Because Titanfall 1 wasn't gonna make you want to play Titanfall 2. Oh. But uh, 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 it goes on sale for like four dollars all the time on PSN. If you this is this is your PSA, go go buy yeah. Titanfall 2. You know what they needed to do to boost those sales? I have legitimately, this is a legitimate thing. Is they it? should have done a Gundam crossover. They, <laughs> they should have. Especially Gundam that. Wing. I don't know about that name. They're not the audience for Titanfall 2 is not gonna be weeb enough for Gundam. They might be, because I mean yeah. that's like like you consider the audience for Pacific Rim. Like yeah. Pacific Rim turned a lot of people into weebs. Um, really? Okay. Uh, but Pacific Rim is just kaiju battles. <laughs> <laughs> Mech kaiju battles. <laughs> so the 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 problem here 
is that because the game didn't do very well financially, and this was EA's fault, by the way, because they made it come out literally a week before the oh, Battlefield game yeah, of that we're year. Back to EA. Yeah, we're we're always back, to back to EA. A week. <laughs> A week before Battlefield. Um, that's, that's pretty sad. So EA basically took this game out back and shot it uh, the same way that Nintendo kind of tried to for Pokemon Legends Arceus, where they had it come out in January for a Pokemon game for children. Yeah. Um, At least it did well. It, it did well in yeah. spite of that. Titanfall 2 did not. Um, and it basically, the Titanfall property has been stripped for parts at this point and eclipsed very thoroughly by Apex Legends. Um, and we're probably one. just never getting a proper Titanfall 3, especially now that Respawn is working on uh, Jedi Fallen Order 2. Yo, or whatever that, that's going to be called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but nate let's get mass effect 2 out of the way <laughs> <laughs> so i i i would say mass effect 2 normally it, the issue is that i actually think mass effect 2 is one of the it is some very similar to resident evil 4 and that i like resident evil 4 but i like the original stuff better and i even mm. like thing. so my issue with that i was saying that is that i actually have a two better examples First one is going to be from my childhood. Well, they're both from my childhood. Um, the first one, I think, is very, very simple. Uh, Pokemon Gold and Silver. Okay, 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 um, okay. When I got finished playing the uh, first red, blue, yellow, did not, I did not expect, as a 11-year-old, how much Gold and Silver was going to blow my ass out of the water. <laughs> like, I love those games to death because of it. Uh you know, it started this whole trend where I, I started wanting to see the original protagonist come back as, as a secret boss or a way to fight them, or even just a continuing story. So when, uh, you know, and, and that's why, to me, Pokemon peaked then. Um, they peaked then, huh? Oh, they sure. peaked then for me. Uh, because I'm an old man and I'm a boomer. I uh, <laughs> I think, well, Gen 2 as a favorite is not an unpopular opinion these days. Um, I think that a lot of people are re-examining their nostalgia um, <laughs> and the way that it makes them feel about the modern games. And I think that Pokemon's got actually two moments like that. So the thing with Pokemon is that uh, it's never been in any real danger of failing. Um, the first game like sold like gangbusters for a Game Boy game, and every subsequent game has just been bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but in terms of the direction of the series, I think that Gold and Silver was the first big... Uh, the first big risk that they took that paid off really well. And I've mentioned before, I think that Black and White is the second one. Makes sense. I, I keep hearing, I have to actually have to come back to black and white because I keep hearing from multiple sources, some about Bailey's age, some about our age, and I think a little bit younger that black and white is that's it. That's Every, the end of Pokemon. Everyone I hear about, like, talk about, like, Pokemon always says that's the, like peak. Like, mm -hmm. Gen 5 was just like peak. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would honestly probably agree with that. Um, and especially over. Uh, Diamond and Pearl, which Diamond mm -hmm. and Pearl weren't like super disappointing, but it did genuinely kind of feel like, oh, this is just Ruby and Sapphire and Fire Red and Leaf Green, but now it's got two mm -hmm. screens. Oh. Um, I think that Black and White uh, represented a pretty major shift in what we could really expect from Pokemon, starting with the fact that like the art direction changed pretty significantly mm -hmm. uh, and it became a lot like flashier and more impressive as compared to like the very standard boxy feel mm -hmm. that that Diamond and Pearl had. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff changed and we've not really seen anything or seen something like that happen since apart from the obvious being the transition to 3d um especially since you know a pretty common consensus now is that the series has only been on a decline um up until very just, recently right. yeah yeah, yeah. that's such recently. a long yeah. fucking time ago holy shit yeah <laughs> yeah that was that was 10 years ago next year oh my god yeah uh the Gracefully transitioning over, the other one is Thug or Tony Hawk's Underground. Ooh, um, that game had no reason to be half as good as it was, and instead, I got this compelling narrative about overcoming 
my shithead of a rival who was at <laughs> one time my best friend, Eric Sparrow. Eric Sparrow. Uh, and, you know, like my rise to a skateboarder, uh, that was what created my skateboarder phase for a little bit. Yo, Nate was a skateboarder? I tried to be. Yo. Being, being clumsy and overweight as a child does not help. <laughs> I, I think that um, Tony Hawk's Underground uh, kind of came at a time when the the star of the series had faded, not Tony Hawk himself, but like the actual, the luster of the series had faded somewhat because yeah. Pro Skater 1 and 2 were like cultural touchstones for yeah. the PS1 at the time. Um, yeah. I, I don't think that anybody... Uh, much less the people that were making them expected them to be as massive as of a hit as they were because they happened to hit right around the time that extreme sports was coming into massive prominence in the 90s mm -hmm. um but then i think that pro skater three and four were just kind of more like it's kind of just the same yeah. thing um yeah. so i think that underground was sort of an attempt to soft reboot the series and unfortunately mm -hmm. uh it didn't go too much further than that there were a couple more games made but then we saw uh, yeah. the unfortunate experiments with the motion controllers and then we got uh pro skater hd which wasn't pro skater hd and then we got pro skater 5 yeah which is pretty much that was the the bullet in the brain for the series but i do think that one in the the one and two remake has been has been pretty solidly successful mm -hmm. so we'll see what more we see uh, out of that, I, th I think that the one and two remake could also probably qualify for this list, but I don't have a lot of personal experience with it. Same, same. So, Bailey, what have you got for a sequel that did not have a right to be as good as it was, and you can't say Kingdom Hearts 2? You know, I was going to say Kingdom Hearts, but you fucking got me. So. <laughs> it's actually Trail second chapter that should not have been as good. No, Trails to Azure, my, my favorite. <laughs> Um, He's lying. No, that's my favorite. Um, <laughs> so, I could go really obscure here and talk about a Tales game called Dawn of the New World, which no one's going to have anything to talk about. Or No, I'm familiar with Dawn of the New World. So, Dawn of the New World. It being better than Symphonia is a spicy take, though. I don't... Uh. So, Dawn of the New World is like, I think... I don't know. So this, so this game, Nate. So I don't think you know. No, I'm, about I'm familiar. Gone of the New World. Oh, you are. Okay. Remember, so, I played a surprising amount oh, yeah. of Tales games. I forgot your weeb too, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I don't think it's better than Symphonia. Yeah. But like I think it, it, it had a better idea of what it wanted to do. It's just that its gameplay kind of sucks ass. <laughs> yes, it does. It, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really bad. It's it's kind of unfortunate, and I don't I don't have a whole lot of love for the gameplay of the early 3D Tales games. Really, okay. Abyss is the only exception here. Um, I think that Symphonia's attempt at transitioning into the third dimension was kind of clunky because it really wasn't an attempt. It was just your character would face enemies and you'd switch between them to be on a 2D plane. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, Colin, this is a fantastic segue. Thank you. Um, you know which series did not have a good transition into 3D? Are you going to say Sonic? I'm going to say Sonic Adventure. <laughs> okay, so how, is, how are you tying this into the topic? Which, so, what, what Sonic game was... was... All, right, all right, so recently, right? Uh -huh. So recently. I've never played Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 until like a couple months ago, right? Yeah. So I played, and so I played the Steam versions, which... There's a very big distinction between the old version, apparently, and the Steam version. Yes. So, mm -hmm. I played one. Thought it was, you know, it was, it was actually pretty good, you know? It's pretty alright. Um, then I played two. And this is, like, a mix of the first half of the podcast and the second half. Because Sonic Adventure 2 feels like the Kingdom Hearts 2 of Sonic. Because it's, like... So, they kind of forego all type of, like, exploration and and Sonic Ed and like Sonic Adventure 2. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And they go balls to the walls, weird sci-fi story shit. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. that is kind of fucking great. And I kind of love it. And it I feels really like yeah. I love the plot 
of Adventure 2. The I like the plot of Adventure of, of Adventure yeah. 1 as well, but I think yeah, that yeah. Adventure 2, like there is a reason why this is the game that spawned like an entire subsection of the furry fandom. Um <laughs> this game is compelling. Um it is, it is. Yeah. The problem Maria. is that the gameplay, especially in the original versions and basically any version that can't be fan patched to help this, uh, <laughs> is is pretty largely crap. Um yeah, it's not, it's not great. <laughs> So here's here's where Nate's gonna. That's not a hot take. <laughs> no, it's not. It's no, not. it is a hot take though. It is. Um, and Sonic Adventure One's gameplay has aged worse, but I think that too, uh, as kids, I think we gave it a lot of leeway. Yeah. Like I don't know if I because like when I was playing two, right? I didn't know if I was just fucking insane. Well, like it just did not feel good to control, and no. I wasn't because whenever I I hear about this game from like fans, right? Yeah. Like. Because like if you ever t- like if you ever like say that Sonic has a rough transition into 3D, it kind of spawns a lot of like vitriol, right? Yeah. So yeah. I was like, I kind of hesitate to say it did, but it kind of feels like it did when I just play these two. Because I I grew up with like Heroes and like Shadow, which aren't that like they're they're fucking fine. Um, <laughs> but like when I compare how they feel to how these feel, if like these feel a lot more like rough to play. Yeah. So I I think that with Sonic, it's an interesting case because Sonic's uh, transition to 3D was more gradual than just going Mm, from uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 3 to Adventure. Like there were a couple Mm -hmm. of like weird spinoff games in between that sort of tested out. Sonic 3D Blast Mm. and uh, the Mm. the Race Rush. No, Rush was DS game. That's Sonic Um, Garner. Yeah, Sonic Garner. Yes, thank you. Where you feel the sunshine, Um, Colin. So Sonic Adventure... (laughs) isn't isn't that terribly rough i think that where the roughness comes in was once they tried to start retooling the series and then once the jump to hd consoles happened mm. was was when sonic was just sank for a while and that is yeah. that is why really mm. what most people would agree to be the only good sonic game for a good long stretch of time is sonic colors which did not come out initially on an hd console yeah it came out on the Wii, and the Wii is bad. two GameCube staple together. Yeah, Colors, Colors is, like, the one game I didn't play. So, like, I was a fucking Sonic fucking fiend when I was, like, young. Like, I played fucking everything, right? Like, I played fucking Riders, I played Zero Gravity, I played fucking Secret Rings, I played Black Knight, I played fucking, like, Heroes, I played fucking everything, right? Mm-hmm. Colors is the only one I just didn't play, because I just didn't know, like, it fucking, like, um, like, it was like pre me being on the internet, you know. So, oh, yeah. like, so when it was, so when it was getting the remake, I was like, oh shit! Like the um, re like master, I was like, yo, it's finally time to play it. And then I played it, and it's like not, it's like not good. No, <laughs> unfortunate. And like now mm-hmm. I'm scared because like I'm like if I play Unleashed or like these old, old like these other like same era games, are are they gonna like will they also be not good, or am I just being weird? Sonic is a mixed bag because I'll be honest, I didn't Dang. grow up to Sonic <laughs> too much, but I s- played the hell out of Sonic Adventure DX on the GameCube. Yo, shit, classic Nate. Okay, uh, um, so much so that I would really load up the game for just the cow garden sometimes. Or Yo, like, this was so an everyday right, occurrence. Wait, I gotta, me. I gotta, I, I gotta fucking ask you, Nate. Right? Yeah. So, what is the obsession with the cow like garden? Because I, I don't fucking know at all. Uh, so the cow garden is pretty similar to other pet raising games. Mm-hmm. You get an egg, you can either toss it against the wall or let it hatch naturally to get a cow okay. or a chow. Okay. Um, you then feed it different stuff and every animal you collect along the racing or on the, the courses, you can go present to the, 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 the little chow mm-hmm. and it upgrades its stats. It's honestly kind of a way to bring value, more value into the stages while keeping um, them untouched, basically, and mm. keeping a retention of what was, you know, cl- mm. classic Sonic with the, the animals that every robot was made of animals and you're collecting them. Also making you grind. Also Ooh, making grinding. you grind. Um, but then you could race them and have them visit your friends, cow, uh, thing. The biggest, hypest version was because of the game boy advance connectivity oh, in the gamecube mm. uh you could have little mini games and, and that was for me it ended up 
kind of tying into my Digimon obsession and then my uh, thing, which I've always had an exception with, is raising animals for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of right on my thing but as i was saying about sonic in general um the they're kind of a mixed bag because 3d sonic has some really good highs at points but some really low lows um and really embarrassing lows yes you know the highest high though man sonic 06 plot is like actually insane (laughs) <laughs> you know i like look back on on, on those on fucking 06 now and i'm like man you know they had fucking ambition they had they had fucking passion when they were making 06 yeah okay okay <laughs> okay i i have i have a uh my second one uh i've been thinking about a lot lately okay uh yakuza kiwami 2 Oh, 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 I don't know if Kiwami 2 was really... So Yakuza 2, the original game. Mm-hmm. Um, the original Yakuza's were, were pretty largely overlooked, especially outside of Japan, yeah. um, to the point where, I, if I recall, the second the original version of the second game never never made it here ever um no, they, uh, no, they did i think it just wasn't dubbed it just, over it was no okay only the, correct so only the first game got dubbed um, yes to to they all they came spent over. way too much money on the cast Yo, Mark yeah. uh, they spent kingdom hearts money on the cast Mark Hamill. but if it had paid off man we'd be getting mark hamill as Yo, I, wish, I don't need i don't need that I more than wish what Machima, i've already got i wish machima was mark hamill um but i think that when kiwami one came out uh we were still basically on a lot of the issues that the the ps3 engine had because uh kiwami one originally came out on the playstation 3 in japan and it it only came out on the ps4 here um and it really shows in its engine and it's a little bit too faithful in terms of also adapting all of the extreme jank from the first game. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, with with Kiwami 1, the game is, is pretty brutally unfair in a lot of places. There's a lot of bosses that just have complete bullshit uh, going on. You basically have to... Uh, chug potion after potion in order to make it through the end of the game uh, because there's really no avoiding how much damage you're going to end up taking. Um, Kiwami 2 is, and here, I don't think that this is that hot of a take, Kiwami 2 I think is the best Yakuza game. Um... Because I think that uh, Zero is the game that ultimately broke through in in the West, but I think that Kiwami 2 is just everything that I could possibly ask for from a Yakuza game, Um, especially how expanded it is over the original game. Um, the, The... like the hugely expanded explorable area, all of these side stories are top notch. Um... And the story is probably the best, I think, out of out of the first six games. And I've played all of them. Um, I think that two is is the one that that actually sets up and pays off the best within its own game. And it does not have a lot of, or it either doesn't have or doesn't yet accentuate a lot of the problematic elements that that. Uh, and not problematic, like politically, like problematic, like oh my god, are we really doing this again? That plague, uh, the 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 whole back half of of Yakuza. Um, so like when when Daigo gets kidnapped in two, it's not old and fucking tiresome yet, like like it is by the time it happens in five. Um, yes, but like he's gone more often than he's actually around. Um, and, uh, just Ryuji. Ryuji is a villain. So good. Ryuji Goda. (laughs) 
So outside of Nishikiyama, I th- I think that Ryuji is is the one out of all of them that it is just like the singular most worthy opponent. I think he is the villain that is set up the best uh, and has like basically the most personal motivation in terms of like comparing it to Kiryu because the later games go pretty off the rails, especially six. Um, but I think that two is just it is it is just like the most singularly straightforward, best put together game in the franchise. Um, and I think that if it had not been as good as it was, because I think that six, uh, when it came out in the West, it came out after zero, but it kind of landed with a thud. Um, I think that. You... Yeah. I think that two was the game that really redeemed the dragon engine after it had been kind of janky in six and showed like, oh, we can use this to like make these games like the actual proper like kung fu flicks that they've been going for this whole time, as opposed to just having to to like make a bunch of bullshit happen in our crusty old PS2 engine uh, to make it look like impressive stuff is happening. <laughs> I agree. No, it doesn't. Um, and I think that it's it's easier to to handle this if you like actually take two Kiwami on uh, the the actual chronological track of games because it's followed by uh, by seven and Judgment, um, both of which I think veer in different directions but expand on the stuff that that really got started in two in terms of the mechanics of the game. So that's one. I've got a I've got a second one. And this is one that uh two of us are gonna unfortunately have much more to say than than the third. Um, and that is Final Fantasy XIV, A Realm Reborn. Um and I do count it as a sequel. It is version 2.0, and the story of it is a direct sequel to the story of the, the legacy version of the game. And I think that we're, we're, we're going to eventually do a Final Fantasy XIV episode of Stray Memories, not with this exact uh, set of hosts necessarily, but I think that like a lot of the video game market would be very different without final fantasy 14 being rescued from an early grave um by by the success of a realm reborn because it genuinely just took all of the things that people hated about the original version and fixed them and that's all that's all it really had to do but it took a herculean effort in order to actually make it happen Mm mm-hmm because like what other competition does it have it's got guild wars it's got runescape what else even <laughs> eh? Eh? yeah i i i think that that's that one was redemptive of not only uh not only final fantasy 14 itself but kind of of the the modern mmo genre um and i think that it's like massive success almost kind of put a a foot in the grave for the genre at the same time because that was the point where i think a lot of companies realized no if you want these things to take off and work the way that you're thinking they're going to you are going to have to put some real solid effort into it because this was the tail end of a point in time where there were just MMOs falling out of every fucking crack in the game industry. They all thought that they were going to like be able to make the next World of Warcraft, and it didn't work. Um, and I think that this was the moment where they figured out, oh, this is what you have to do. And it does like it kind of the kingdoms, eh, kingdoms of, of Amalur 
uh, kind of like has a very World of Warcraft aesthetic to it. Um, it's it's very much that like cartoony but serious like darkish fantasy world. Um, and it's got like all the multiple biomes and stuff like that that you see in an MMO. So I think I think that that's like a pretty big greater scope example of a sequel that that no one expected to be as good as it was and it was so good that it rocked the entire industry to the ground. <laughs> Nate. Oh, I know. It's back now, by the way. If you haven't if you haven't heard the 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 free trial including the acclaimed Heavensward expansion that allows you to level all the way up to level 64 completely free, play as much as you want to. It's available now. Have you got another one? Because we've still got a little bit of time left. Do you mind do you mind if I interject here? Cuz I don't I don't think that Resident Evil 4 was necessarily it it's amazing, but I don't think that it was like quite nearly as much of a redemptive like turnaround like this we had no reason to expect this to be as good as it was nearly as much as Resident Evil 7. Um, because where four like reinvented the gameplay of the series and was extremely inspirational to a lot of games after it, it's not like it came after a series of really bad games. Um, because seven comes after five, which is racist, and six, which is boring. Five is extremely racist. All of the bad guys in all of the bad guys in five. Are 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 angry tribal dressed black men? All like like that is that is that is that ver that game's version of the zombies. Um, it's it's not good. Um, and then six was boring. Six six was way too long. Um, the the split protagonist thing uh, meant that the stories when they crashed together made no goddamn sense because they didn't know how they were going to write it properly. Uh, the twists were stupid. It's a lot of things in Resident Evil 6 sound like they should be hype as shit, but the game is boring. <laughs> the game is boring and cringy. And and seven crashed in and was just like, oh, let's take this back to like the thing that this series is actually supposed to have been about, which is being scary. <laughs> and it did it completely brilliantly. Mm. And it's and it's kind of like it's kind of nuts that taking the series in such a different direction like they both brought it back to its roots but also made it something that it had never been before because this is the first game in the series that's first person this is the first game since uh two that was like effectively a a closed circle bottle setting um and it brought back a lot of elements from the previous games that people really loved and just amped them up i would i would handily say that seven is probably the scariest game in the series 
I don't I don't think that that's that controversial. Um, and it also brings back like the the proper uh, not quite satirical, but like reimagining of the the scarier elements of modern Americana that that were such heavy influences on the first two, especially games. Um, because like Resident Evil One, you have like the 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 ultimate bad guy is just a fucking capitalist who who you know thought he was gonna make a shit ton of money and ended up getting the entire the entire city destroyed. Resident Evil Two, uh, you play as a brand new police officer who finds out that uh, the the Raccoon City Police Department uh, was actually sketchy as fuck. Uh, before it was destroyed um and the series as it got more action focused kind of veered away from that and then seven brings it crashing back in with the bad guys you know quote unquote bad guys being just a stereotypical southern family and they take it to its logical extreme and make it absolutely terrifying <laughs> but like at the same time i think that like we don't really have the same fondness for like horror b movies as we used to now we have like more serious and earnest attempts at just pushing scares um and I think that Seven reflects that really well, too. So with that, uh, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, so... <laughs> We, we had a lot to say this week, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. Um, but I want to thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Stray Pixels podcast. We post every Tuesday, theoretically, on your podcast app of choice and on the Noisy Pixel YouTube channel. Uh, let us know in the comments uh, what sequel do you guys think should never have been made, or what sequel do you think, uh, if it hadn't been made, the franchise would have been doomed. Uh, let us know in the comments on YouTube. Let us know on Twitter. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to talk to us, or if there's anything you'd like us to talk about on a future episode, uh, you can also let us know. You can find me, Colin, at, at the Arcane Ranger. You can find Nate at, at Less Than Nathan, and you can find Bailey at, at Orpheus Joshua. Uh, and you can find the website itself at, at Noisy Pixel News. The Stray Pixels podcast is brought to you by NoisyPixel.net. Noisy Pixel is run by a group of gamers who work hard to bring you the latest news, previews, podcasts, and more. Please like, subscribe, and follow to keep up with our future content and we will see you guys next week. Bye!